Let's bring him in right now. Let's welcome Peter to the show. We're really excited to have him. He's hanging out in the green room. Awesome Peter. background. Love it. Peter, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome course, to the man. show, course, Peter. Well. Thanks for coming. So to start off, man, um, I just kind of wanted to get how we start off each show to give you a little bit of background is, you know, we get uh, kind of the story of each guest. So if you wouldn't mind, like giving us like kind of how you got into crypto and how you got involved with Offchain Labs, what your background is, uh, we'd love to hear it, man. Sure. Uh, happy to share. Um, so I got into crypto all the way back in 2015. I was following like Ron Paul um, and those guys. And uh, I saw somebody talk about Bitcoin. I was like, what is Bitcoin? Sure. Open a Coinbase account. I think Bitcoin was 250 bucks at the time um, and uh, picked up some Bitcoin and then wondered like, what the heck did I just buy? Right. Um, <laughs> So that, that was an interesting experience. Uh, fast forward to 2017, I was working at Adobe. Um, the crypto bull run started and I saw somebody talk about Ethereum and I knew what Bitcoin was at the time, but I was like, what is Ethereum? Um, I went down the Ethereum rabbit hole from there. Um, and I, I was very fortunate early on in my career to, to join uh, the Tendermint team. So after Adobe, um, I, I, was, I was there and I was uh, wondering to myself like, you know, I could stay at Adobe. Adobe is a great company, but I, I really wanted to get more involved in the space. And so I met, you know, Jay and Zucky and um, a lot of those guys and um, was really excited about the Cosmos team. So I, I worked there for over a year. Um, after that, I transitioned to Parity. So I worked for the team behind Polkadot um, and I, I worked closely with Fabi and with Bjorn um, and Dieter and, and a lot of those folks to you know, help to grow the Polkadot ecosystem. And then um, a, a year after that, um, I had a chance to join Offchain Lab. So I, I met with uh, AJ and, and Steven. Um, around the time when I was looking, there was no role that was posted or anything like that. I just noticed that AJ was the only one uh, who's my boss. He's the chief strategy officer. And I noticed he was the only business development person who was working there. And I was like, I think he needs some help. So yeah. Uh, I, that turned out to be correct. And, and so I joined in October of uh, 2021 and I've been here for almost uh, two years now. Wow. I mean, uh, it, it's funny because you, I think, person we're having part of the last we have. Oh, Firestorm, you're cutting out a little bit, man. Um, for joining, obviously, Dexalot originated in Avalanche and we'd love to have people that actually can provide us perspectives outside of Avalanche, right? And, you know, you're going to be doing the honors first. But I want to point out to our audience that that story, you've heard versions or variants of that, right? Folks learn about Bitcoin, then they learn about Ethereum, and then go down the rabbit hole. Obviously, Peter had the opportunity to go earlier. And he also had the opportunity to look at a lot of, you know, different solutions out there. So, you know, would love to hear some of those stories, uh, Peter, because most people that we meet usually, uh, they don't go so far back. They haven't worked on multiple different protocols, etc. So if you can give us a little bit about the story behind Arbitrum as well, right? Because you guys have recently launched. Congratulations on a very, I mean, it's somewhat late now, but still very successful launch. Community has been growing quite well. Tell us a little bit about how Arbitrum came to be and the premise behind it. Yeah, it's a great story. So the the story of Arbitrum actually actually originates in Ed Felton's classroom. So Ed, uh, for context, is our chief research scientist. Um, he he used to be a professor at Princeton, um, and he gave this assignment to his PhD students all the way back in like 2014 or 2015, where he said, "How do you scale a blockchain?" And so the the rough um, idea that the the students came up with was Arbitrum. Um, and so even way back then, he kind of realize that blockchains are going to face limitations. And this was, you know, before Ethereum. Now, at the time, um, Ed had an opportunity to go be the deputy CTO of the White House. And so that idea was kind of shelved and, and he went about his way. Um, fast forward to 2017, um, you guys probably remember there was this project called CryptoKitties, which, you know, crashed the Ethereum blockchain and uh, created quite the buzz uh, towards the end of 2017, early 2018. And so at the time, Harry, our CTO, and Stephen, our CEO, were PhD students, and they came to Ed and they said, hey, this is a real problem. We need to solve it. And, and Ed said, well, I have this idea of Arbitrum. Why don't we pick this up? And so that's how 
Arbitrum really got started. And so, um, it, you know, really uh, the Arbitrum project has roots in academia, um, but uh, that, that's, that's the origin story for it and, and where it is today. I, I think that's very cool, right? Like almost all scientific sort of breakthroughs originate. I want to say, actually, I mean, this is going to be a big claim, but all the ones that I know of originate in academia in some shape or form. So that that's kind of a cool story. Like, is there a separate story behind the name or like, do you, do you know that or just curious? I believe it's related to like an arbitrator. Uh, so if you think about the challenge sure. protocol or the fraud proofs uh, that that's related to Arbitrum, I think that's that's the idea behind it. And then you could see like Optimism's name is like optimistic roll up or Optimism. So that's where those names came from. Very cool, very cool, very cool. So. You know, our audience uh, knows mostly the avalanche way of scaling, but obviously there's a lot of discussions around, you know, L2s. Do you mind just giving what an L2 is, why it's important from, you know, the pers like, assume we know nothing. And if you can just give us a high level before we go into Arbitrum specifically. Yeah, 100 percent. So, you know, the concept of a layer two is that it handles execution off chain. And then it posts the data back onto the layer one, uh, which was recorded as called data. Uh, so because of this, everyone has uh, all the information for the current state of the chain. Um, and so if needed, you could you know, reconstruct the state of the chain based on this information. And so this is different from, let's say, like if you have like a subnet or like a Cosmos zone where in the, that model, you have your own validator set. And so the security of the network is rooted in the validator set. Uh, whereas with a layer two, the security is more so rooted on um, the, the originating layer, which is the layer one. Um, so that's the idea behind a layer two. Perfect. And, you know, there are different ways of creating layer twos, I believe. Right. And, you know, can you give us a little bit about what an optimistic roll up is as well? Just so, you know, we have we have an understanding. Sure. Um, and I can also mention a little bit about ZK2. Um, and so <clears throat> in an optimistic rollup, it means that the validators post the, the data back on Ethereum and they assume that the claims are correct. Now, there's this seven day period uh, where folks can submit a challenge uh, to challenge it. So let's say if they don't, in most cases, most folks aren't challenging it. They believe that the, the, the state of the chain is correct. Then, then Arbitrum just confirms the rollup block is correct. And where did the seven day number come from? It came from Vitalik. He just said, hey, this is this would be a good number if you think about it. You know, probably three days is probably too short. Folks would forget stuff on the weekend. So seven days probably uh, makes the most sense. Now, in the case of if uh, folks do challenge it, um, this means that it's going to utilize fraud proofs in our dispute resolution protocol. Um, and if a liar is found to be guilty, then they're going to forfeit a deposit and the truth teller ends up receiving a reward. Um, so this means that parties who try to cheat on Arbitrum, it's going to be very rare because people don't want to lose their deposit. Um, so that's that's effectively what an optimistic rollup is. Now with a ZK rollup, it's a little bit different. A ZK rollup uses a bunch of fancy cryptography. Um, they have to do ZK proofs and then post it to the chain um, after they uh, submit a transaction. Um, and so there's pros and cons with that approach. Uh, the pro with the optimistic approach is that it's going to be more EVM compatible. Um, it still has extremely low fees, 90, 95% cheaper than Ethereum mainnet. Um, and with the ZK rollup, one of the benefits is that supposedly you can batch more transactions together to get lower costs uh, over time. So there's trade-offs there, but to generate those ZK proofs, it's extremely expensive. Uh, for you know, folks to do that, right? It, Computationally expensive, comp therefore it's harder to keep the fees lower. Yep, understood. It, exactly. Whereas in an optimistic rollup, most of the time you aren't submitting a fraud proof, you aren't doing any of that, so it's actually computationally inexpensive. Um, and the nice thing about Arbitrum is you could check on RB scan, but we actually post data back to Ethereum very frequently, so you could see that the blocks are posted, you know, quite regularly, like ten minutes or even more frequent than that. Um, if you look at some other ZK rollups, it might be several hours before they're able to post, uh, you know, their validity proof back to the chain. Understood. So I guess does the again, and I apologize if this is a dumb question, but is it optimistic because most of the time you don't have to provide the fraud proofs, and those are only required when there's a challenge? Is that why it's called optimistic, or is there something else behind the name? 
No, that that's fairly accurate. Um, and I would say that we have had a case where, you know, folks have actually submitted fraud on the chain. Um, if you guys remember, uh, Ethereum had this period where it upgraded from proof of work to proof of stake. And so someone actually tried to submit fraud uh, on the Arbitrum chain. And it turns out one of our engineers, Lee, was actually running a validator and was curious if anyone would do this. He submitted the, the challenge um, and actually ended up winning. Um, so, wow. so we actually do have working fraud proofs with Arbitrum today, and and that's something I'm really proud of. That are definitely yeah, that's shipped. that's fantastic. I know there's another solution. Uh, you know, quite honestly, at least from where I'm sitting, we hear a little bit less about it. But do you mind just giving us a little bit about Nova as well, and you know how it differs? Sure. So <clears throat> one uh, ask that we've had from developers is they they want extremely low fees uh, within. Um, uh, within the ecosystem. And if you look at an optimistic role of today, the, the reason why it's, it's low is because it handles execution off chain and posts the data, but we still don't have sharding, right? So on Ethereum, we're working towards EIP 4844, the proto dank sharding work, and then the full dank sharding work after that. So we expect that we're going to see at least, you know, hopefully between a five to 10 X improvement. So imagine you move the decimal spot over like one, um, <laughs> that, that would be ideal. And so because that's not here yet, um, our, our team wanted to provide a solution and we've been working closely with Reddit to scale their community points. So several years ago, we won a scaling contest where we competed against a bunch of different teams. Reddit ended up selecting us for their community points. So that means that for the our cryptocurrency subreddit and the Fortnite subreddit, they have these tokens that, uh, that users can earn. And so, we, uh, we brought out the the original Arbitrum idea, which is more like a Validium. So the main difference between Arbitrum 1 and Arbitrum Nova is how the data is posted. So with Arbitrum Nova, it has the data availability committee, and it still has strong security guarantees. So what, what do I mean by that is that you only need like two of 12 uh, to to validate that the chain is is correct versus something like in the Tendermint model where it's like, you, you, you need like 75% or something. Um, and so let's say if there's an issue with the data availability committee, um, Arbitrum Nova can still fall back to the rollup mode. And so that's one of the most interesting things about it. Um, we've had some awesome teams uh, deploy there. Um, and so specifically we're focused on gaming. So we have teams like Pirate Nation, uh, which is one of the co-founders of Zynga uh, that's building there. And then recently our team announced support for Aurori uh, which is one of the top Solana-based games that's building there. Um, and so we try to provide solutions for developers. So if they need a, you know, a high security-based uh, optimistic rollup, well, they're probably going to use Arbitrum 1, which is the home for DeFi today. And then if they need like a, a solution for gaming, for high throughput and super low fees, they can use Arbitrum Nova. I was literally going to ask the, that exact question, and I think you answered it right before. So anything... High throughput requires a lot of transactions, which would be the case for games or other, you know, uh, lots of things happening type applications are probably better for Nova then, right? Yes. Very That's cool. Very cool. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, I think it's fair to say you guys have the largest L2 ecosystem at this point. You know, there are obviously a few other uh, solutions out there. It, you know, it's quite cool to see. You know, especially the dynamic between different ecosystems. At least we, you know, as the Dexalot team, we believe that you know there will be a fit depending on your use case, potentially on either one specific solution or maybe across all of them. But from you know a scaling perspective, is Arbitrum One today going to be enough, in your opinion, to onboard a large amount of you know the Web two applications that? benefit from moving to crypto or you know does arbitrum team and off-chain labs have a plan to create additional uh scaling capabilities and if so you know would you be able to share some of that you know forward-looking stuff with us yeah 100 percent um i would say for most teams a general purpose roll-up is is probably good um and the reason for that is because you don't have to maintain your own chain so Trying to maintain your own chain is a ton of work, as I've seen in the Cosmos of Polkadot ecosystem, uh, you know, with uh, Cosmos zones and parachains. Um, but, uh, you know, if teams are able to find product market fit, if they need more scaling beyond that, um, right around the time when our when the Arbitrum token was announced, there was an, another 
announcement, and I think a lot of people kind of missed it, but it's called Arbitrum Orbit. Um, so the idea behind Arbitrum Orbit is that if you're a developer and you want to spin up your own Arbitrum chain, you can do that permissionlessly as a layer three, or you can submit a proposal to the DAO. Um, and if that's approved, then you can submit, uh, you can build your own layer two. And so that means developers can use our existing code base to, to run their own chain. And so, um, you know, we've been working closely with, you know, others uh, in, in the space to help them to do this. So for most of the teams we work with, we try to work with Rollup as a service provider. So those are folks like Caldera and Altlayer and Conduit. Um, and then sometimes we work, you know, in-house as our own team because we have our own limited bandwidth. So that's like teams like Xpopulous and, and what Sobe and those folks are building. Makes a lot of sense. So then, you know, like the concepts are quite close to, I think, you, you, at least for the Orbit case, you know, is that the closest thing that you would recommend for an application specific chain? And I guess, you know, is that your solution for applications that want to be able to run their own chain? Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's totally fair to say. I mean, honestly, I think what we're really seeing in the Ethereum space is we're seeing the Cosmos thesis being played out. I think, um, you know, Jay and Bucky and those guys were correct in what they said. Um, but now it's interesting how all the rollups are like, hey, we want to be Cosmos too. So, you know, Optimism started with the super chain and, and the OP stack. That's what they have. Uh, we have Arbitrum Orbit. Um, and all these all these chains will eventually have their own interoperability. They'll they'll be able to communicate and talk to each other and, and have their own pros and cons. Um, but the nice thing about it, is, I think, is is the customization. So if you have your own chain, you can customize that chain based on how you, you want to do it, and you're not limited in the base layer chain. So what do I mean by that is like, let's say if our team introduces a new feature, um, that could end up on Arbitrum Orbit first before it ends up on the base layer chain because you don't need approval. You could just go build it. I think, I think that's a very interesting approach because typically at least projects that we met before or, or even you know the approach that Dexalot has taken was deploy on the generalistic chain, see how everything goes, but then there's a very successful project that shows up that causes gas to go crazy or affects the user experience. And then people think about the application specific chains. I almost want to say, you know, what you just described probably is the more interesting approach where you deploy an application specific chain, make sure your product works, make sure you have product market fit. And as the base, base sort of solution improves, if you decide that you don't necessarily need to maintain your own chain, you can either you know, move and migrate, or you, uh, if there's communication between the general chain and your own, you're done already. Like, how does the uh, Orbit to Arbitrum 1 communication work? Is that available already, or what is the plans there? Yeah, it's just bridge-based communication. So it's the same way that Arbitrum 1 uh, you know, communicates back to Ethereum. Um, it's the smart contract uh, that we use for the bridge. Um, it, it's the same capacity. Now, what's unique about that is you can actually build an Orbit chain that settles to L1 Ethereum or an Orbit chain that settles to both L1 Ethereum and Arbitrum 1. So you have some optionality there. Um, I, I, our team certainly wants to work with others that are that want to build their own Orbit chain. But um, my recommendation still is try to find product market fit from the DAP perspective. If you find product market fit, um, you know, then maybe build your own Orbit chain. Because I think if you look at these general purpose uh, smart contract chains, like our, even Arbitrum 1, they're not even being fully utilized yes, yet. Of course, <laughs> not yet. Yes, not yet. Not yet. Hopefully, that day will be you know arriving soon. But you know, again, like I, I find it fascinating, like the approach with respect to the design, the sort of the roadmaps. Like if you just compare roadmaps across different solution providers, you know, different decisions being made always fascinates me. Um, if we if we take a little bit of a step back, so then. You guys are live now. Uh, I know the governance process is ongoing. You have NOAA, you have the Orbit capability. Like what are your top objectives today? Like what, what are the top things that, you know, the off-chain labs team and Arbitrum community is focusing on right now? Yeah, I mean, the number one objective is to ship the most decentralized, scalable and best-in-class technology. Um, and so, 
if you see if you've seen this post Vitalik has where he talks about rollups removing training wheels, uh, there's three stages of that. Um, so there's stage zero where most rollups are today. You can go to L2B and see these stages uh, on the website. Um, so that's stage zero. Most most rollups are there. It's you know they're more centralized. There's stage one, which is where Arbitrum one is today. It's the only general purpose rollup that's there. Um, and then stage two is uh, rollups that are fully decentralized. There's no training wheels. Um, and, and we've reached uh, the final land. And so uh, considering that, and um, our team is working on several things. So one is the new challenge protocol, uh, which is gonna enable permissionless validation. Um, so when Arbitrum 1 started, I, it launched all the way back in August, 2021. Offchain Labs was the only validator and, and, and ran it. Um, we've opened that up to a whitelist. So now there's more folks that are validating the chain, but ideally we want to make that permissionless so anybody can run a validator and, and validate the chain. And so that's uh, one of the new exciting things coming up. I think the next thing is going to be decentralizing the sequencer. Uh, of course, the sequencer hot is topic. what... Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a very hot topic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, so decentralizing the sequencer is super important. Um, a lot of folks have been talking about that. And then there's... Um, there's another interesting initiative that we haven't discussed today, uh, which is Stylus. Um, so Stylus is a, an interesting initiative that's being run by Rachel, uh, one of our engineers. And what that's going to do is it's going to enable uh, developers to build in Rust, C, and C++ natively and interact with EVM-based code on Arbitrum. So um, what that means is you're not going to be running a separate virtual machine like a Solana VM and an EVM or something. You can actually build and both with Wasm on, on Arbitrum Rust-based code that communicates with Solidity-based code. And we think that this is a this is a game changer. We call it EVM Plus. Um, uh, we think that you know EVM is the floor, and and this is going to continue to you know expand to more programming languages and open it up to more developers. Um, and we're excited about that because there's a lot of developers I've seen personally, you know, from the Polkadot ecosystem that build in Rust or, you know, the Solana ecosystem, uh, they build in Rust too. Uh, but also we can open that up to Move or Go or uh, uh, Cairo or other programming languages. And so we think that this is going to help to separate Arbitrum from some of the other layer twos out there that only support, you know, the EVM, like a lot of the ZK rollups that are out there today. Um, and we're really excited about that. And then, of course, I mentioned Arbitrum Orbit. We plan to improve that, too. There's going to be more support for interoperability and standards around that and so forth. You know, that's very cool to hear because, you know, I have the distinct sort of observation over the last, you know, I'm going to say four to five years where the most popular technologies of building things have slowly started to, like, come down and the rust the Go, et cetera, sort of becoming a lot more popular and every sort of new new person, you know, completing their degree and going into the world wants to build in one of those more high performance or, you know, newer, more featured languages. So that's very cool, cool uh, to hear that you guys are looking to support that as well. Okay. Um, you know, I wanted to ask uh, one more question, at least for projects that may actually be listening. You know, for folks that want to deploy on Arbitrum, like how should they start? Where would they start? And what do you recommend them do first? Yeah, so we have some awesome docs that's been created by Daniel Goldman and Mick and, and others on our team. Uh, we also have the Gorley testnet, so I'd recommend just deploying there. And the reason why I say that is because Arbitrum supports all the existing Ethereum tooling. It's, it's going to feel exactly like Ethereum today, so it's very easy to deploy and build on top of it. Um, and we, you know, we've even heard better improvements with our, you know, recent Nitro upgrade um, that's based on Wasm and Geth. And so, yeah, uh, feel free to get started on the docs. We're happy to answer any questions or, or chat with any folks. Um, we also have an awesome integration engineering team that can help to answer any questions there. And I think, uh, I think last time we talked, I know it's been a little while, but you, you guys were launching a sort of ecosystem support program is that live now uh is that you know should we sort of give some instructions to the folks that may be listening on how to sort of apply mm -hmm. what is the status of that please yeah so uh at uh, ecc uh we we ran a, um uh, or the arbitrum foundation ran an event there uh that was uh, that was pretty fun and one thing that they announced is uh, grants. So now uh, the Arbitrum Foundation finally has a grants program. 
I'm uh, really excited about that for almost two years. I've been operating without a grants program. So I'm, I'm really glad that we, we have support for that now. Um, I believe that there's been a ton of applications uh, that's been submitted so far. So if folks are, you know, looking to get more involved, um, want to reach out, uh, you know, it's at arbitrum.foundation and you can see the, the grants uh, part at the top. Awesome, man. There you have it, folks. There it is. Guys, remember, uh, if you want to ask a question to Peter during the AMA, all you got to do is drop it in the chat. And it looks like we got a special guest star. Our producer's cat is even making an appearance today. Awesome. Shout out to Chopak. Um, Peter, you were talking a little bit about uh, Fortnite and your Reddit community. I just kind of wanted to wheel it back and touch on that a little bit because obviously, you know, we, um, the, our community is very important to us. And so I just want to uh, ask you, like, what were the challenges you ran into, like building a community on Reddit? Um, because I'm very interested in Reddit, but it's a it's a beast that I haven't really poked yet. You know what I mean? So I'm just kind of interested in your take on that. Mm. Um, I, I think so. We worked closely with the Reddit team itself, so I don't know if uh, oh, yeah, okay. our team has focused as much on sure. like trying to grow our own Reddit community. Sure, sure, um, sure. Yeah, but uh, so, you know, some of the challenges of of working there was just trying to get Arbitrum Nova spun up and and making that happen. But I think one thing I'm really proud of uh, for our team in general is just the community around Arbitrum itself. And so our team had this period when Arbitrum started where all developers could build. Um, and so whether you needed a Dai stablecoin, Chainlink, Oracle, Gnosis, Safe, whatever, we had that. And so Arbitrum has been able to amass a lot of like great DeFi builders, including you guys that are, you know, considering building on the chain. And so I think it's it's amassed like a lot of these uh, crypto native DeFi folks that that love uh, coming to Arbitrum. And so the way I view it is like, you know, blockchains are like amusement parks. And so you want to have the coolest rides. And that's why I'd love to work with great builders like yourself um, to just try to provide the best experience. And <clears throat> we've been able to do that because if you look at the data, it shows that, you know, we have over a billion in, you know, bridged USDC volume. There's over a million in ETH that's been bridged to the chain. And so what a lot of folks are finding is that when they build on Arbitrum today, they just have a better experience. They're able to get more volume, more users. Sure. Um, and we've seen this from various teams. And so um, that's something I'm really excited about. And uh, I think it'll bode well for the future. Jimmy, uh, we need the horn in case people missed it. Let's just give the horn just a little, the alpha yeah, just, horn. Because I, I looked at the camera. You yeah, know what I mean? I, I, saw, just that, kinda... I saw that, you know. <laughs> there you go. This That's is our alpha horn, horn Peter. Alpha when, horn. you know, nice. some, every now and then we'll drop some alpha, you know, stuff that we haven't said to the people. But you did it, all, you know, in our stead just a little. So I'm right. not going to repeat it, but. Whoever's you must watching, watch the playback. Just watch the VOD, guys. You yes, know what I mean? That's right. Um, what <laughs> another thing I thought was really awesome is you talked about Fortnite. And you, what you don't know is that, you know, our, our Twitch channel here, we often, even though we're an exchange, um, we love the Web3 gaming space and we love to support it as, in any way we can, really. So we do gaming streams from time to time. And one thing that always comes up when we're talking about gaming is Fortnite. And I feel like this is this is the game that is like so conducive to a Web3 environment, to onboarding Web2 players to Web3. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. When you brought that up, I was just like, yes, we're not, everybody, we're, we're, everybody's on the same page here. Fortnite is going to be the one. What, what, what draws you to Fortnite as, as uh, an, an off-chain lapse? Like what drew you guys to Fortnite initially? Uh, well, I think it was uh, so Reddit made the decision to to work with those communities initially. Okay. So I can't can't claim that it's us. Okay, now, all right. Per personally, I've been to GDC, so the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco. I met with Epic Games. Um, sure. They're a super talented team. Um, I think that personally, for gaming, I'm most excited about the indie game developers. Um, and the reason why I say that is because. I think that the breakout game is more likely to look like a bungee than it is to look like uh, some uh, a triple A, um, and that's yeah. just because you know those <clears throat> indie games are just indie game devs are just more open to utilizing blockchain technology, experimenting with it. You guys have seen this in the Avalanche community. Uh, we've seen this too on, on Arbitrum Nova, and so. Um, I just think it's a matter of time before we see a breakout game just because games take, you know, anywhere from two to three years to ship, whereas a DeFi team takes three to nine months or something. Right. And, 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 and the sort of craziest thing that, you know, I think every indie game developer thinks about is, 
what is a triple A? And the definition of triple A is different depending on who you ask, right? If you go and right. ask a Blizzard executive, they're going to say hundreds of millions of dollars of budget, right? Right, right. And like in the game developers competing with that have a sort of monumental task ahead of them. And generally speaking, I agree with you, right? Like the folks that create and fit the genre for which you can develop with smaller budgets and have more experimentation with technologies that enable you to do things that are unconventional, right? Right now, you know, most Web2 studios don't really, at least yet, have a big incentive to push into the space, especially given the regulatory unclarity. You know, people, people laugh at me when I say this, but even big game publishers have regulatory concerns, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, anyways, uh, you know, we've had a few games on, on the show as well, and they said almost exactly the same thing. So I just wanted to echo that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you might be able to tell I'm a bit of a gamer myself, so we do have a, <laughs> so, but anyway, you, you're um, talking to a, the guy who was playing CSGO last night. So yeah, exactly. Oh. I was playing, uh, the, I was playing some Dark Souls three convergence mod last night. I was playing a Dark Souls mod last night. So. Nice. Um, and it's very difficult. <laughs> so, but um, all that being said, man, uh, uh, Peter, I just have two questions for you uh, before we let you go, man. Um, first of all, I want to say I want to point out that I had to take off my hat. And <laughs> and Peter, another thing that you don't know is that when I take off my hat, that means my brain just grew. We call it big brain time here over on the show because I learned so much about Arbitrum today, and I'm sure that everybody in our chat. Learned a lot about Arbitrum today. So I just want to thank you for coming on the show and schooling us so much. You know what I mean? It's really cool. Um, but I did want to ask you, uh, would you be willing to come back to the show and, and talk more about Arbitrum? Because we'd love to have you come back and, you know, give us even more developments as they come in. Of course. Uh, it, it's been f uh, fun on here and, uh, you know, really appreciate the invitation. to. to of course, man. Of course. I, think, I think this is one of those things that we just got to focus on a lot more, right? Given where Web3 is today, like the pie is very small and we need to have different opinions, different solutions. And, you know, we as projects particularly need to keep our like minds open yeah. to all the other things that are happening outside of our small niche that we start at. So like, you know, we as Dexola kind of want to do this more. So we appreciate you coming to the show. It means a lot to us. Definitely, man. Definitely. Um, and I have one last question, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, mm -hmm. If you notice, we were playing some music at the top of the show in a former life. I was a, I was a professional DJ. Um, mm -hmm. We always uh, get a request from each guest. So I don't mean to put you on the spot. You don't need to come up with anything right this second. You can send a song to our producer if you don't have anything right off the top of your head. But I'd love to get a request from you to take us out. We play a bit of music on the tail end of the show. Um, so if you got anything off the top of your head, I can take it right now, or you can send it to our producer and, uh, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it cracking. Oh man. Uh, I, I've been grinding away. So I mostly listen to lo-fi music at the, <laughs> at the moment. Hey, hey, listen, I, we uh, do all yeah. kinds of, I, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, 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 no. So yeah, n nothing crazy off the top of my head, but, uh, yeah, whatever you think is best. Something chill, something chill for you. Something chill. <laughs> something, uh, I, I, you know, I got the perfect song. It's summertime. It's really hot here. I got I got something for you. It's not exactly low. It's got more old school than lo-fi, but it's like lo-fi old school. You know what I mean? So there you go. <laughs> awesome, man. Peter Heyman, senior uh, partnership manager at Offchain Labs, Arbitrum in the house. Dude, we really appreciate you stopping by and and uh, dropping so much knowledge, man. This was awesome. And uh, we're so really much, excited man. to have you come back, man. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, Thank man. You, sir. We'll have see you. Have a great day, dude. Take care. See you again soon. Bye.